do we think it's recording? Yes, I think so, because it has the little. Okay. Welcome, everybody. Good afternoon, and thank you for joining us for the Letters Unit 4 Worksheet Walkthrough. Um, we'll take about 30 minutes. Hopefully, it will be very helpful time for you. Um, and we will be talking about all of Unit 4, so hopefully it'll help you to, you know, kind of develop a better understanding for what we're looking for as you work through that unit. Too many clicks going on. Hit record, so we're good. Okay, so as you both well know, we do have uh, professional development norms that we will be attending to during this training, being committed, be responsible, be respectful, and be safe. And I know you're going to do all those things because you actually are here, and so you're anxious to get the information, and this will be the best way for us to, to do that is by observing these norms. If you do have a question anytime, please just interrupt us, unmute yourself and ask your question, or you can type it in the chat and we can see that. Um, and we will try and get all your questions answered as, you, as they occur to you in the moment. And also there is a time at the end, if you wanna just jot them down on a sticky note and then go back to it afterwards, we can do that too. So either way works. Everything that we do in Canyons District is based on our framework. The blue part is the instructional framework, and that includes not only our academic routines, but also behavior and our, our way of teaching, which is the instructional priorities. The red section of the frame is all about data. You can see the framework, right? I should have checked that you can see my screen. Okay, thanks, Susan. <laughs> Um, sorry, and that, that is the data section of the framework. And we do use data to drive our instruction and to, to know where our students are all the time so that we are able to meet the instructional needs of our students on a very regular basis and make groups that attend to their needs. The yellow part has to do with teaming, and that is how you team with your colleagues in your grade level and in your school and how you work together to problem solve around closing the gaps in student learning. Today, our learning intention is to work through the unit four worksheets and how to submit them in Canvas. And you'll know you're successful when you submit them all and you completed them. And you can do a little happy dance because you will be finished with four units of letters and finished for this year. Exactly. <laughs> so we're just gonna go through why first the bridge to practice is so important. And then we're gonna talk about the worksheets for each of the bridge to practice assignments. And then we'll answer questions. So the why of the bridge to practice. And basically the bridge to practice is the, it's, it's the, the most important part of the learning that we're doing with letters. Um, we all know that knowing is how to, knowing how to do something is very different than actually doing it. So that's where our implementation of letters is so critical in actually changing the student outcomes. Because if you and I know how to do it, but we don't actually change our practice, which is the painful hard part, then the student outcomes aren't going to change. And um, it's, it's hard to, to recognize in yourself when you're, you're trying to do something, but maybe falling short of your goal. And then someone says to you, which may or may not have happened to me personally, well, then you're not doing it. And I was like, and I got in the car after the meeting and I was like, that's absolutely true. I'm just not doing it. So it is, um, 
it's it's a very hard thing and we're asking you to do something that we understand is very difficult which is changing your behavior and trying new things and taking risks they're all very difficult so why do we do three case study students instead of just one we do three because each student is unique and they have different strengths and weaknesses and they learn differently and at different paces and different things motivate them. So those, the students need that and the teachers need to be attentive to the unique challenges of each student and how to attend to those unique challenges because things that motivate different students are different. And if, if a, something is really interesting to Billy, he's going to really perk up and listen and master it when he masters it. And Joey may not get it for another long time. So it's our job to figure out how to attend to both those students and their unique learning needs. All right, so now we're going to move on to what are the eight session bridge to practice assignments and just briefly go through each one. The first one asks you to look up 15 words. It could be 15 words um, from any part of your lesson or your day. You might take them from your spelling list. You might take words from ECRI, Reading Street. You might take them from your content lessons, your math lesson, your social studies, science. Uh, kinder might consider taking them from their read alouds or their amazing words tier two words uh, or the tier two words in their stories. So any 15 words you're going to be using next week uh, with your kiddos. And for each word, consider how does the origin of this word impact its spelling? And that might be, you know, that it has the, the Greek CH or that it's uh, from Anglo-Saxon and they're always compound words or that most of our irregular words come from Anglo-Saxon and the Old English. So, and that doesn't have to be an in-depth analysis. It can be a few words or a sentence like Anglo-Saxon compounds would be enough of an answer or the Greek CH would be enough of an answer. If you need any help, you can look at the uh, Oxford English Dictionary or another great resource for finding origins is Etym Online, E-T-Y-M-O-N-L-I-N-E. Dot com and it has the origin of most words most words i've looked up there have their background as well and so it's really just considering how where that word comes from contributes to its spelling and how will you introduce the information to your class so you might introduce that if it's part of your spelling pattern you might just reference that it's from that if it's from um, another content you might reference how that word came to be in English and why it's important. For example, if it's from social studies, that's actually the, the content with the most words, not from English and the most borrowed words because it's about history and things that happen all over the world. So you just might be referencing that. Um, it's etymonline.com, Susan. Etymonline. As in etymology. Yeah, short for etymology. Awesome. So for any 15 words. Then you're going to just move on from there. And now you're going to move on to planning some more uh, phoneme graphing correspondence activities with your kids. So just going to think about how can I get them to practice that phoneme graphing correspondence a little bit more and add in one or two of these routines. You can use other routines. These are just some of them that are mentioned in that chapter in this session of letters or that you might even see in our maps. So you can use any of these, say it, tap it, map it, download, uh, and you can download it from here. Once you get the video, you can, once this is linked up online, you can click those links and they are all live that will take you to the tools to be able to do it. So you can use any of those. You could also use it to just enhance your dictation routine in ECRI. Uh, kindergarten teachers might consider your spelling test. So you're just going to say, what activity did you plan? And then in that box, what words did you use? So I did say it, tap it, map it with these five words. And it might even be helpful to just um, use some of those words from 4.1. If they're from your next lesson or something, you might just use some of the same words and then just elaborate on those words by using one of these routines. And then how did it go? 
what worked about it, and then how can you build in more practice or make it more effective? So just if it went well, you can say it went well, and I'm going to try to do this daily during foundations or daily during skill-based. And if it didn't go well, then just uh, reflect on what you could tweak to make it go a little bit better. And Susan, jump in if you have any questions. Okay, for 4.3, the question is how and why should syllable types be taught? And the, the big idea with this one is that when kids are learning to spell words, we break them into syllables and then we spell them a syllable at a time. Or you break words, big words, if you're reading and you come across a big word, you wanna break off parts that you may recognize so that then you can swing under and read the word when you can't read the whole thing right off the bat but you have to know where to divide the word, which is where the syllable types come in. So if you are, are dividing a word into syllables, you need to know that in a word like wheat, you would never divide between the E and the A because that's a vowel team and you just don't divide those. You divide a word before the consonant LE syllable in a word like purple, so those are the types of things that if kids know that um, you, you don't divide up certain parts of a syllable, then they're more likely to divide the word properly and pronounce it properly because that will determine whether the vowels are open or closed. So the next one, 4.4, is when and how should morphology be taught? And this is getting to how do, you de how do you use the meaning of the pieces of the word to determine what it means? So when you come to a word like unpublished, you can ask your kids, is there any part of this word that you recognize that we can cut off? So you can cut off the prefix un, and you can discuss the meaning of un. You can cut off the suffix d, meaning in the past, and then you get back to that root word so that then you can talk about that. And that's how morphology can, can you can use it to your advantage to teach the meaning and the syllable division in those words. So you're going to use one of the routines that they talk about in 4.4 to say, what skill did you teach? How did it go? Again, what worked, what didn't work? Where would you tweak it? And where could you place this instruction in your foundations block or to make it more effective? And you can see on the screen there are uh, two samples. So the bottom one is the kinder assignment for both 4.3 and 4.4 we recognize kinder are probably not doing very many multi-syllabic words <laughs> at all <laughs> and that would be above their scope and sequence so for first first grade teachers and above we want you to do the one where you're planning teaching that morphology because it is important that your kids get it in the scope and sequence so first grade teachers aren't going to worry about teaching a multi-syllabic word that's like file because that's way above a word part like file, like bibliophile, but you would teach the inflected endings. So that would be a multisyllabic word that works for first grade. But for our kinder teachers, we still want you to know these rules and um, own them. And so the kinder teachers are going to do just practicing with all of the rules. So they have a slightly different assignment. And that's kind of what you saw on that screen. All right, 4.5 is a discussion. What you're asked to do for 4.5 is administer a spelling test. We've attached the basic spelling screener and the advanced spelling screener from letters. But if you know of others or have done other spelling screeners in the past, feel free to use any spelling screener. But what we want you to do is administer a spelling screener. And you can administer it however you want. You could administer a whole class and then collect data for your whole class to see if there are patterns that whole group instruction might need to address. You can administer it just to your small group that contains your 
bridge to practice kids just to see how they are doing, or you can give it to uh, your bridge to practice students individually so that you can adapt. For instance, you might give one of them the beginning because you think that's where they're at. And you might give a different one the advance because you might think that's where they're at. So you have all of those options, but what you're asked is to administer a spelling test. And then once you have to analyze the errors. So even if it's only for all three or whether it's your whole class, what patterns did you notice? Are they all making the same mistakes or, or a bunch of them making a few mistakes? And then what are you going to do to fix that? So just like every discussion, your first post should be about 100 plus words, just what did you notice and what are you going to do? And then please respond to a couple people. And as you're responding, kind of look and see what other patterns you're seeing that kids are making and then what, what are teachers doing? And that's what we really want you to get from discussions is maybe an idea from somebody else if they're trying something that you might try someday. All right, and 4.6 is practicing reading fluency. So first just reflect on what activities you're using and how they address fluency. And then consider your case study students and what fluency weaknesses, issues do they have? And then how can you work with those three kiddos to increase their fluency? and then reflect and then do it and then do whatever activities you chose to increase their fluency and then reflect on how it went. And you can, if your kids all have the same fluency issue, then you can use the same routine with all three kids, but they would probably respond differently. So in your reflection, you know, student one might've caught on more quickly, student two might struggle with certain patterns. So you, Feel free to use the same routines if your kids have the same issues, but in your reflection, you might highlight how they responded differently because their mastery would look different even if they have the same gaps. And you can use any of the fluency routines in that chapter, uh, in that session. We talked about the alphabetic prosody routine, just letter naming fluency, speed drills, the oral reading routines, or any of the partner reading or repeated reading routines. So wherever your kids are at, which routines do you think they need to work on? And I would just add um, on that one, when you, when you think about fluency, keep in mind that fluency is a measure of rate and accuracy and prosody. So if you have kids that are, are maybe struggling with their prosody because they're word callers and you want them to be more expressive, you might want to use some of the reader's theater books that are in your um, teaching kit with Reading Street. Or you might want to, you know, if they're not accurate in the map, and I think I put a link in the, um, uh, in our Canvas um, announcements, there's a link to the table tap routine that's in the map, and that is a very effective way to get kids to slow down and be more accurate. So keep in mind, you're going to do different, different things to correct them depending on what part of their fluency is failing. All right, 4.7 using decodable text. So you are going to, to use decodable text with your kids and then reflect on this um, for each of your case study students. And the idea is you're going to consider all of these items, um, oral reading rate and accuracy, language patterns, word recognition patterns, spelling and writing patterns, phonological awareness patterns, and what goal do you have for student between now and the end of the year. So you're going to consider each of those items for each of your three kids in terms of what is the student's strength. So you look at oral reading rate and accuracy. Is this a strength, a yes or no? And then you're going to refer to what evidence did you use to make that determination. So you may be able to use their Acadian scores would be a really simple example of that. Um, or you may be able to use you know, if you do a cold read at in small group with your case study students, 
you could print off one of the decodables, have them read through that as a cold read, take that rate and that accuracy as far as the number of words they missed, and that could do it because the um, although the Acadians data will reflect and inform that um, you know thing that we're trying to to understand, it's not from decodable text. So you you will want to use decodable text to to measure this one. Um, and then so you do their strengths and the evidence that you have and how you got it and then their weaknesses and again your evidence and that will give you as the instructional leader in your classroom insight into what you need to work on related to fluency using decodables. All right, and session A, the last one of this year of the series. Yay. We did stray a bit from the letters bridge to practice. It asks you to compile kids and write a reflection on each kid and pass it on to the teacher for next year. But we really didn't see that as the best um, bridge of, to practice for your knowledge. So what we would like you to do is it's a discussion We'd like you to think, just look at each unit, unit one, unit two, unit three, and unit four. And for each one, what from that unit resonated with you? What from the uh, unit one about the brain research and the science of reading really stuck with you, whether it's the fisty brain or whether it's the different parts of the brain where everything happens, just what resonated with you? And then how have you embedded that concept into your teaching so far like have you taught your students or do you just remind yourself of that as you're working with your students or do you go back to that when you're making your lesson plan however uh, that impact however that idea has impacted your teaching and then how do you see yourself using that in the future so for each unit a few sentences a paragraph about what stuck with you and why and we think that will be um, the best way for us to reflect on our learning right now with our kiddos. All right, those are the worksheets, the bridge to practice at this point. Do you have any other questions or want to go back to any of the assignments and ask a question? Mm. <clears throat> I don't. I got to. So will this this video be on mm -hmm. the Kenyans you okay so I can yeah. go back and read it again um mm -hmm. I think mine more would be the um the spelling I had I mean learning the syllable types I mean it's been very I didn't learn that growing up nope. <laughs> so, <laughs> having to get even teaching up until the last year or so um doing the reading street and where we're so, so it's just a learning practice for me too so i think that will probably be one of the aha moments on how to do those section three and four awesome oh. this helped me i didn't learn the syllable types either and i did letters then i learned it and then i did another pd where the presenter called the used the acronym clover for the six syllable types, closed, stable L E, O is open, uh, V is vowel, vowel T, yeah, vowel, vowel controlled, and then magic E, uh, the E R. So that worked for me. Or yeah, E is magic E, and then R is the R controlled. So yeah. the acronym Clover helped me remember all six of them. Well, that's good to know. Yeah. I'm still trying to figure out doing phonics 95 <laughs> or 95, the library thing we're doing mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I'm like closed open what are you talking about <laughs> I have no idea. well you'll get that more in um unit four so it'll make a, you'll get a little bit more practice with it yes that'll be good <laughs> awesome <laughs> yeah and did you um do you know if your you or your colleagues um signed up or ordered the um phonics rings that we had um an order on the tab tablet the, the, the long card uh -huh. things are on the yeah. ring yes. had, yeah penny just brought them to me a couple awesome. weeks ago so i have those okay and i think there's one in there that has the syllable types on it and the 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 
symbols for those, right? I, okay. I think there's a there card is. in there, there that be. has that. All so right, and I think refer him, to that. Yeah, CMR came up from first grade and she went to the first grade academy. So I'm thinking she probably already has them. Um, the syllable type wasn't in the first grade packet. It was in the second and third oh, grade okay. packet. So, so I'll ask her if she has if she has it, but okay. I do. I did get it a couple weeks ago. So awesome. Good. good. And some of those routines are they're, you know, they're evidence-based and mm -hmm. they're based on the science of reading. So you can use them regardless of what program you're teaching. They're good routines. Okay. I'm shocked that we're using evidence base. And it's I know, being canyons and <laughs> <Really>? all. <laughs> Back to the case? framework. <laughs> yeah, that's great. So, well, thanks for joining us this afternoon, Susan. It's fabulous to see you as always. Oh, thanks. Thanks, you girls, for doing this for us. So, all right. You're welcome. See Take you care. soon. See ya. Bye bye. Bye.